Welcome everybody. Um, we're going to do uh, chapter three, a short uh, lecturette over uh, uh, some of the main points in chapter three and to get you ready for your exams. On the, I'm going to open it late Sunday evening and then let it run all the way to midnight Tuesday. So for those of you who need a little extra time for study, you, you can you know, take the exam as, you know, don't get too close to midnight because you don't want to run out of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, you would certainly still be safe at 10 o'clock uh, on uh, Sunday evening. So you still got time to study and finish your reading. Um, but uh, before, I, before I say a few things about the, uh, the chapter, uh, which really has some really great points, and uh, we could spend a lot more time. I'm trusting that uh, your reading is paying off for you and that you understand the con. If you don't have... Again, if you're having any problems with uh, understanding the concepts, then just send me an email asking me to clarify uh, either a theoretical notion or concept or a comparison of two of them that you want to compare and contrast, for example. Just let me, just email me, let me know I'm here for you. So, um, so I do trust you now on your, your reading ability and your, your ability to understand these, though I know that sometimes that students are not going to always be. 100% uh, crystal clear about uh, what some of these uh, concepts may may mean in relationship to other concepts, for example. Uh, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I want to give a, a review. I like the chapter. There's a lot of really interesting points, and I could spend several hours on any of these uh, talking, but I'm just going to kind of just go over some of the main points, and then there's one area I'd like to spend a little extra time, uh, excuse me, just addressing uh, so before before I do that, though, I just wanted to say that uh, I've been contemplating my exam. Generally, my exams online are, are I only allow one question at a time, and uh, so it's not formatted for you to be able to go backtracking. And of course, we instructors try to do what figure out ways to set these classes up so you know minimizes uh, students' ability just to spend their time looking up answers. Instead of uh, reading, reading and knowing and, uh, and coming to understand the material, uh, but uh, I, I, I have my second thoughts and, and uh, about uh, just one question at a time. No, no allowance for backtracking. So I, I've decided to just see if this will have great outcomes. Uh, I'm going to set it up where it's open, and uh, so that you can see the uh, all, exam all at once to be able to backtrack, go forward and backwards, and. Uh, just like just like if you were in, in class, uh, and then uh, I do randomize the questions, however, so how the questions are arranged on one student's exam is not going to be the same as the next. Uh, and I give you a, a, a window of time. Generally, I give you an hour for uh, to take these exams. And uh, when it was just one one question at a time, I gave a little bit more, just a little bit more time. Uh, but with it fully open and your ability to move back and forth, uh, I give you the uh, just a little bit more than what I would give in class. Uh, so uh, that's one positive perhaps for, for a lot of you uh, uh, to know that uh, I'm going to change that, that testing format for you. Uh, okay, uh, so what I'm going to do is instead of going from one little section to the next is I'm, I'm over on page 134 and I'm looking at the sociology of prejudice and it's, we're summarizing the chapter by considering some of the key points concerning the uh, sociological approach to prejudice and you notice that in this uh, that in this uh, chapter that gives you several different theoretical perspectives on the origins of, of prejudice if you will the chapter starts out by looking and distinguishing between discrimination and prejudice so certainly read all that material and again I trust you on your reading but let's just look here and take these down to from one to six uh, the first says that prejudice has its origins in competition between groups and is more a result of the competition than a cause. And uh, this is certainly true for the, for the competitive uh, critical power uh, com conflict or even Marxist perspective on the origins of prejudice that's based in group competition, those theories. Uh, so check, check those out. It is created at a certain time in history to help mobilize feelings and emotional energy for competition and to realize, rationalize the, cons the consignment of a group to a minority group status. So in many ways that minority group status can become a scapegoat uh, on which to blame one's poverty, 
for example, if, if you're a member of the dominant group, instead of looking up towards the, those at the top, you blame those below you. You know, that's one of the ways in which uh, prejudice has worked. Uh, it then is absorbed into the cultural heritage. That is, that the conflict situation over real material conditions, uh, such as job shortages, uh, layoffs, um, or there's a conflict between two groups and you make one a minority group in order to use that group to, as a sort of a battering ram against which, against which to, uh, uh, to conquer and divide and conquer, if you will. Uh, but in the end, it feeds over, even after, long after this initial uh, conflict. It, it, it is absorbed into the cultural heritage of the society, and it's passed on to later generations as part of their taken-for-granted world, uh, where it helps to shape their perceptions and reinforce the very group infer inferiority, inferiority that was its original cause. Uh, and uh, this kind of gets at, uh, they're getting at a couple of notions here. One is the uh, conflict perspectives, conflict power perspectives on the causes of prejudice. Uh, and it's also looking at that, uh, uh, the, the cycle in which uh, prejudice plays a role in reinforcing uh, those, uh, this, these, the uh, inferior status of the minority group uh, through prejudice over time, over generations. So, for example, in the South, in you know, in the 1890s, you had the the uh, ongoing. Uh, we had this uh, the social movement, the Farmers Alliance movement, uh, uh, an alliance between uh, poor black and white sharecroppers against the planter class. And uh, lo and behold, at the very same time, then uh, you had the introduction of the segregation, uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, segregation of public spaces. Uh, 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 disenfranchisement and then so at this time because of this competition uh, prejudice reared its ugly head so to speak and helped to reinforce the reasons for uh, the uh, segregation laws again that's an uh, that's in a, 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 a blatant form of, of institutional discrimination as I said earlier, that is backed then by an ideological racism, which we had in the South at that time. That ideological racism helped to justify that pre those prejudices. Generally, a lot of prejudices, not all, but a lot of prejudices are born out of the existence of that, in, that blatant form of institutional discrimination and uh, the ideological racism, the systematic set of ideas that uh, makes the claim that a race is inferior simply by their birth. Uh, so long after that, it gets absorbed into the cultural heritage of the area, and it's passed on to later generations. So this is one way in which stereotypes, which are, uh, if you will, uh, even after the ideological racism has been dismantled, those prejudices continue in the cultural heritage, handed down from one generation to the next. So the next generation of kids, they learn the same prejudices that their parents, for example, had. And it helps to reinforce that prejudice uh, over generations. And in the end, uh, uh, a contradictory aspect uh, feature is that it helps to then in future generations still to continually to reinforce the sense of or the, or the social construction of a certain group, a minority group, as an, in an inf inferior position. It gives justification for continued poverty, for example, uh, among uh, minority groups. Uh, long after the, the, the initial conflict period. Uh, so with the advent of the uh, success of the civil rights movement, you had the, you know, the end of Jim Crow laws, you had the end of ideological racism. But, but even today, uh, you know, our society, not just in the South, but all over the country, is still steeped in prejudicial views. I got you know, look at some of the react, reactions to, uh, um, to, the, to the election of uh, Barack Obama as president and uh, all the both verbal and and also the symbolic signs, caricatures that you have seen all uh, relate to this uh, first uh, proclamation here, if you will. Second one, number two, changes in the social environment, rising levels of education, or changing forms of intergroup contact will have relatively little impact on some types of prejudice. 
Prejudice that is caused by scapegoating or authoritarian personality structures, structures for example, is motiv motivated by processes internal to the individual and may not respond to changes in the environment. So the chapter makes that distinction between cultural prejudice and personality based. Personality based tends to be deeply ingrained in individuals, has to do with their psychological makeup, and may be uh, harder to get rid of. Uh, authoritarian personality structure, or study that, and uh, how it responds. Mainly, mainly it, it, it would respond to psychoanalysis, uh, but not for changes in the cultural environment, for example. Um, so it may be uh, difficult to reduce these types of prejudice and impossible to eliminate them altogether. But a more realistic goal might be to dis discourage their, their open expression. Uh, the greater the extent to which culture, authority figures, and social situations discourage prejudice, the more likely it will be that even people with strong personality needs for prejudice can be turned into prejudiced non-discriminators, or timid bigots, it's called. That is, you keep your prejudice to yourself and you don't go around uh, proclaiming it because uh, you, your social context would see that as you, you know, that you're either, either ignorant or, uh, uh, you know, that it's, uh, it's deviant to, to have those, such those beliefs and feelings. So you just keep it to yourself and you don't certainly don't discriminate against people based on your these prejudicial feelings. It doesn't mean this doesn't go on. Certainly it does. But it says, if you read closely, that uh, that the goal of uh, uh, within the culture, authority figures, social situations, the more more the extent to which we discourage prejudice doesn't mean we'll get rid of it altogether, but uh, it can whittle away at it. The more that uh, it is discouraged by uh, figures and authority in our culture, uh, and within the culture itself, uh, it's discriminate. It's uh, uh, yeah, you know, some people claim for uh, uh, PC, you know. The notion that uh, you know you got to be perfect uh, and that you can't say certain things. Uh, well, that this is the reason why is to try to deflate uh, prejudice in the culture itself. The political correctness, some people will say, uh, in some sense, uh, pre in terms of prejudice against minority groups and others, that uh, that it's necessary. You know, it's a good thing to have that. Uh, that in, in our culture and, and, and that it's spread by the educators and authority figures. Uh, and so this is why, and also in this chapter, they talk about, uh, I'm, going to talk a bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, social distance scale because I've had experience with that a little bit. Uh, but even with, um, but, but even on surveys that have been uh, distributed among, uh, say, for example, college students or college edu educated folks, and looking at their levels of education. And we know, we do know that uh, educate, the more education, the more education a person has, the less, the more education that people have, the less prejudice they have. We know that education has an impact on people's prejudice levels, but it doesn't uh, get rid of the possible bias that, uh, and this gets it to, to what they're talking about here, that because of their environment in a university, and because college students aren't supposed to be espousing certain kinds of uh, prejudicial or uh, stereotypical, stereotypical views of people, uh, that uh, maybe they they're on their on the uh, when they do these surveys that maybe they're just saying what they think people think they should say in their situation, and not really saying what they really feel. And this is one of the problems with this kind of research. Even though we do, there's been so much research done that shows that cultural prejudice can be highly reduced through uh, through education. The more education we have, the less prejudice we tend to be. The less educated we are, the, we tend, the more prejudice we tend to be. Uh, number three, uh, cultural-based or traditional prejudice can be just as extreme as personality-based prejudice. This type of prejudice differs not in intensity, but in the degree to which it is resistant to change, as I was just talking about. Cultural prejudices it can be remedied through uh, education and also in, in bringing folks together in, in, like, say, task groups, work groups, and they work together in a non-competitive situation can also have an impact on cultural prejudice. A person who acquires prejudice from being socialized in racist environments 
should be more open to change than the authoritarian personality and more responsive to education in contact with members of other groups. To create more all-weather liberals, he uses this term, situations that encourage a reward or reward prejudice and discrimination must be minimized. In public opinion, the views of community and social leaders and the legal code must all promote tolerance, said the multiculturalism movement, for example. And then the reduction in overall prejudice over the past five or six decades documented in Exhibit 3.7 is probably mainly due to the decline in rational, and I'm sorry, in traditional prejudice. Uh, so just the overall cultural prejudice in the society because of uh, continuing educational levels, changes in the community's views, and also the promotion of uh, multiculturalism through social leaders, also legal codes has promoted uh, a much more tolerant uh, society than in the past, even though we do have many incidences in every day of intolerance. Uh, but we're looking at overall, not just single uh, case studies, but the overall reduction in society of prejudice. The question, the, the, the remaining question to ask is, so is prejudice then gone, or does it lay dormant? And, and this is still an ongoing argument. Uh, some, especially with conflict, uh, sociologists say, well, prejudice during good times, uh, lots of jobs, nobody's, the competition's down, uh, that people's prejudice will be lower. As soon as things get, get tight in the job market and times are not good, then prejudice tends to rear its ugly like head again. So they, they're from the dormant side of the argument. Others say that we can actually get rid of it and through socialization and uh, generations hence will be reduced in terms of their overall prejudice. Uh, but there's no, there's no um, decidedly, there's, not, there's no real uh, uh, final answer as yet to that question. Uh, number four, intergroup conflict produces vicious, even lethal prejudice and discrimination. Intergroup conflict, conflict between groups. But the problems here are inequality and access to resources and opportunity, not prejudice. So from that, again, that conflict perspective, uh, prejudice and racism are not the causes of the problems. The problem, the cause of prejudice is prejudice and racism are symptoms of something deeper, and that something deeper are, is the uh, growing inequality and in access to resources in society. So the more inequality you have in society and the less access that's, that uh, groups in society, minority groups have in, in the society, uh, the, more, more, the more likelihood that prejudice is going to be uh, abundant. And we see that to some extent too now in our society with the uh, ongoing... Uh, the base between the so-called 1% and the 99% uh, that we live in an extremely in unequal society at the moment. And this is causing prejudicial feelings. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, group conflicts and the prejudices they stimulate will continue as long as society is stratified along the lines of race, ethnicity, and gender. So as long as uh, society is uh, stratified in terms of uh, one race being better than the other, one ethnicity is on top, the others are below. Males dominate society, and women are kept in a minority position. That's what they're getting at here. As long as and and the stratification uh, is uh, is a continuum. So in some societies, like in Western Europe, we have less uh, economic stratification, for example, or stratification by race or gender. There's more. There's less prejudice, more equality in the, in our society. We have extreme class division right now in terms of the income and wealth in society. We still are stratified by race and ethnicity and gender. Uh, and as long as you have that, the conflict perspective says you're going to have prejudice. Efforts to decrease hostile attitudes without also reducing inequality and, ex and exploitative relationships between groups, like between the capitalist class and the workers, for example. Uh, treat the symptoms. The only we're doing it is that if without those efforts, then we're just treating symptoms rather than the disease. So we're just maybe trying to reform, and we're, we're diddling with uh, the symptoms of, uh, pr of prejudice and discrimination. We can't really get at it until we get at these deeper-rooted uh, issues of reducing social, economic, uh, cultural, social inequality 
and exploited relationships between groups. Uh, and again, that's the intergroup, that, that's that conflict perspective. Remember that as you read the chapter, <clears throat> reducing prejudice with prejudice with not, I'm sorry, reducing prejudice will not necessarily change the situation of a minority group or minority groups. The fundamental problem of minority group status are inequality and in systems of institutional discrimination and privilege that sustain the advantages of dominant groups. Prejudice is a problem, but it's not the problem. Reducing prejudice will not by itself eliminate minority group poverty or unemployment or in institutional discrimination in schools or in the criminal justice system. Um, so again, that conflict perspective. Chapter, uh, uh, section 6 here, individual prejudice and discrimination are not the same as racism and institutional discrimination, as again we saw in Chapter 1. Uh, so... Uh, and any one of these variables can change independently of the others. So again, as we said, I hope I said, when your book did, looking at the four key concepts in chapter one, that any one of those, prejudice, individual discrimination, you know, uh, ideological racism, and institutional discrimination, can take place without there being, can take place with, uh, without uh, the others. So you can still have prejudice and not have a society, again, steeped in, uh, in uh, blatant forms of discrimination and uh, ideological racism being present, present. As we just said, after that was broken in the South with the uh, successes of the uh, Civil Rights Movement, prejudice continued. Individual discrimination continued. So they, they are logically connected, but they're not determined by, by, by each other. They can act independently. Thus, we should not confuse the recent reductions in overt traditional prejudice with the resolution of American minority group problems. That by electing a, an African American president, for example, all the problems that confront minority groups are now resolved. Prejudice is only part of a problem, of the problem. And in many ways, it's not even the most important part. Uh, so here they're saying the most important part are the ongoing social inequalities, structures of society, social class inequality, race, ethnic, uh, uh, gender inequalities that are structured in society are the real problems that need to be confronted if we're going to confront seriously the issue of prejudice and discrimination. So that's what our classes are really all about, uh, social inequality, the uh, determinants, the uh, roots of social inequalities for this class. I'm pointing you towards what, what's known as a materialist uh, explanation that things such as prejudice uh, and discrimination, but also things that we blame instead of seeing as a cause, uh, poverty, unemployment, uh, lack of health care, uh, non-education, -educa non non-education, uh, lack of education, lack of housing, homelessness, all of these are just symptoms. They're not causes. They're symptoms of a deeper structural inequality in, caused in society. So that cause those factors would be the, uh, the way in which our class system is structured, the economic uh, system disadvantages some and it gives advantages to others. The 1%, for example, notion. Uh, and then the, the uh, continued in, uh Social, social or inequality in terms of, um, of um, minority groups, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, and there's other aspects as well. So, these points are reflected in some key trends in the past several decades. Ethnic and racial inequalities persist and may be increasing despite the declines in overt prejudice. The verbal rejection of extreme or overt prejudice has been replaced by the, sub, the subtilities of modern racism. It has just become more subtle, more off the cuff, uh, combined with an unwillingness to examine the social, the political, the economic forces that sustain minority group inequality and institutional discrimination. Unless there are significant, cha significant changes in the structure of the economy and the distribution of opportunities in society, we may have reached the limits of tolerance in the United States. Uh, 
these are things that we're going to ponder in the next two chapters as we go forward for that next exam. Um, but I'm going to stop this particular section. I'm going to one more little short video because I want to talk a little bit about the social distance scale and, and some of my own experience uh, working with the social distance scale. So I'm coming right back.